get started with the introduction. Um, so I would like to introduce Kirsten Eidenbach and Jonathan Tretheway, and together they direct the Arizona Transformative Law and Social Justice Center, or Atlas Justice Center. Um, Kirsten is also running, or is also a returning presenter at this conference, and we are so, so thrilled to have her back, um, because she's been doing such amazing work in the past year that we just, we can't wait to hear about it. Um, so they are here to talk about their efforts in reentry programming and also their innovative new vision for a justice system that's truly based in a restorative approach. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming um, our new presenters. Good morning. It is wonderful to be back here um, and particularly wonderful to be following Judge Alvarez. For those of you who were here last year, um, she and I presented together um, because a lot of our programs and approaches overlap quite a bit. Um, just to, uh, th there's a slight change in the program. Jonathan had a bit of a catastrophic mountain biking accident last weekend um, and isn't quite up to presenting, but he has a really unique perspective um, and important things to say. So we wanted to make sure that he was available to you all for questions um, at the end of the presentation, but I'll be doing um, the, the actual body of the presentation. So uh, without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about oh, the font, right? I, this is what I get for using really cool, funky fonts, <laughs> is then they never translate over, and so, um, so, at Atlas Justice Center, we really um, have created uh, a business model that combines professional and experiential expertise. I'm a civil rights attorney, um, and I focus my entire practice on prisoners' rights. That's all that I do. Uh, and Jonathan has spent 13 years in the Arizona Department of Corrections. And since his release in April of 2015, he's dedicated his entire career to prison reform um, on a really deep level and to mentoring other folks who are coming out of incarceration. So we bring uh, really both sides of the equation together. And I think that's why we've worked so well together and why we're able to um, develop such innovative solutions. So before we can get to our new programs, um, we really need to look at where things stand at this point. In the United States, we have over 2.5 million people behind bars. That is a lot of people. All of those people um, come from communities that they have been ripped out of. Many of them are going to be rejoining their communities. Um, and the way that our um, reentry resources and societies and communities are structured at this point makes it very difficult for them to successfully reintegrate into their communities and lead successful lives, which creates a revolving door right back to prison. Because often, so many economies um, are closed to these folks when they leave prison that the only economy open to them is, again, the economy of crime. And that sends them right back where they came from. Um, in addition to that, um, and, and this is really one of the root causes, which we'll get to a little later, um, but one of the reasons they have such difficulty reintegrating is that the entire correction system as we know it is based on punishment and revenge. And you heard a little bit from Judge Alvarez about why it's so important to start moving away from those core values. Um, you add corporate profits into that mix and you see the current state of the state, which is why things are so um, broken at this point and why we really need to push, uh, push the bounds of the current system so that we can come up with solutions that actually work uh, and bring humanity back to the prisoners and help them get back into their communities. Um, the current correctional system really institutionalizes both the prisoners and the staff. Um, I have had the pleasure to work with um, Dr. Craig Haney, who is, uh, well, when he was a grad student, he is the one who designed and conducted the Stanford Prison Project, um, which uh, hopefully all of you are familiar with. If you're not, I would encourage you to look it up. But basically, um, the, the findings of that project were that uh, they took a group of students, grad students, 
So nobody who was currently in the correctional system, they divided them into a group of prisoners and a group of guards, and it took less than uh, a week for the entire thing to fall apart. And what Dr. Haney realized is that when you create that kind of power dynamic between the guards and the prisoners, it flips kind of a sadistic switch in the guards. Um, most of the students involved in that project had to themselves receive counseling for trauma and secondary trauma. This is, this is one of the core reasons that our system is so dangerous the way it's currently structured, is that really everybody involved in the system gets victimized by it, gets institutionalized by it, um, which creates the, the hyper-violent and drug-infested culture that we see. Um, and we see also from the data from our recidivism data, it doesn't work. People are going back at a very, very high rate. Um, the same is true in Arizona. If you were here last year, these are the statistics I presented. Um, we have the sixth largest prison population in the country. That's pretty big given that our population is not the sixth largest in the country. Um, we incarcerate people at a rate of 589 per 100,000 people, which is the highest of any Western state. Now, our recidivism rate, this is a hard number to, to find, um, partly because it's, it's subject to a lot of bias. Um, and so the statistic I chose was kind of in the middle. Um, a lot of uh, corrections institutions report that their recidivism rate is more in line with the national, which is around 30. Um, and those of us who work in the field would say it's probably closer to 80. This statistic was put together by prosecutors. So um, just briefly, let's talk about what institutionalization is. I think that Morgan Freeman said it best in the Shawshank Redemption. When uh, talking about the prison walls, he says, these walls are kind of interesting. At first, you hate them. Then you get used to them. And then you begin to need them. That, folks, is institutionalization. And the way that our current correction system is structured, it does not take that much time for that mental switch to happen both to the prisoners and to the guards. They become used to this, uh, this society within the walls because it is completely abnormal, which will become very important when we talk about how it is we can fix this system. And frankly, that institutionaliz institutionalization plays right into most disciplinary and criminal situations. So when you see bad behavior, it's important, and this is probably the most important analysis you can make regarding that behavior, and this is exactly what um, the Guadalupe teen court does. You need to look at why. You've got to ask why. Past and ongoing trauma, addiction, symptoms of institutionalization, systemic predation, prolonged exposure to hyperviolence, untreated or unmanaged mental illness. These are all profound root causes that lie at the heart of many of the behaviors we deem bad. And we cannot get to a solution until we address these root causes. Um, otherwise, you're just putting a Band-Aid on a system that's going to continually repeat itself. It's going to continue cycling the way that we've seen it with the re revolving door where you go to prison, you get out, you can't make it, you commit another crime, you go right back in. And really one of the first, um, one of the first things that we have to do is acknowledge that incarceration causes trauma, period. It is in and of itself traumatic. There's a lot of work that's been coming out, I'd say, in about the past six months about a new trauma syndrome called post-incarceration trauma. And um, in our work with people who've come out of prison, we have found that providing the
the vocabulary of trauma has been one of the most profound tools that we've been able to give the guys we work with um, in coping with reentry. Because all of the sudden they realize what they're going through, they realize that they are not alone, um, and they can seek help because they know what it is they're going through. They know what to call it, they know what to look up, they know who to reach out for. Um, and they also know that it's not just a sign of weakness. We work at this point primarily with men, and it is not easy for a man to call anyone and say, hi, I'm on the side of the road sobbing uncontrollably and I don't know why. This has happened to 100% of the men we've worked with. Every one of them has experienced this post-traumatic breakdown after being released. There are all kinds of triggers. Um, the one that I just spoke about was uh, he was released to a very supportive family. He had a house. He had a car. He had a job that paid him $21 an hour. Okay, so most of the issues that prisoners face when they're released were not an issue for him. And he thought he had the world in his hand. He was fine. He did not need help. Um, and uh, one day his sister-in-law sent him a text that said, we just wanted to let you know how proud we are of you. And that was it. And he called Jonathan, had no idea what was happening to him. It was a trigger that he could not have anticipated. Um, and he did not understand what was going on. And it was only because he had very, very strong relationship with Jonathan that he was willing to expose that vulnerability and that weakness. So um, this is a big one for us because uh, it's really pretty new research. So that leads us into the title of our talk, which is Reading Between the Bars, Correcting Corrections. Oh, this is so sad to me. I wish you all could have seen my beautiful font that I picked. <laughs> but you're going to have to forgive that everything is going to go over. Um, so here are the core values that we embrace at Atlas. And uh, we cannot take credit for these. These actually come from Scandinavia, where in their prisons, they prioritize humanity and normality. What do we mean by that? So the current correction system, when you go into that as a prisoner, you become a number. And what does that do to you? It completely deprives you of humanity, self-agency, responsibility. You are not a human, you are a number. You are a part of the system. Um, and our system of corrections also creates a, a culture and a society that is like nothing you've seen before. It is not within the normal bounds of what we know as culture and society. So it, it deprives those who are in its walls of any sense of normality. Now, the Scandinavian system embraces both of these principles. And guess what? It works in tremendous ways. They have such low recidivism rates at this point that they are selling off their prison buildings because they don't have prisoners to fill them. Um, their recidivism rate is around 10%, which amazingly falls directly in line with Judge Alvarez's statistics about the restorative justice model used by teen courts. And that's because it's a far more effective model than punishment or revenge. Um, a lot of, particularly a lot of crime victims are, um, really led right into this myth that revenge is going to make you feel better, right? If you, if you exact revenge on the perpetrator of the crime that was committed against you, you're going to feel better. There was a fabulous op-ed by the father of a, a young woman who was murdered uh, because he and his family had for a very long time advocated for the death penalty for the, the man who'd murdered her. And once this gentleman was put to death, the family got no relief, none, because revenge does not give you closure. Restorative justice does. Because through the process of restorative justice, that's when it's not just the community that can be made whole, but it's also the perpetrator of the crime, the victim of the crime, and the victim's family of the crime who become whole. And what's difficult about restorative justice 
is that uh, it's a lot more labor intensive because what restorative justice looks like is completely dependent on the situation. As Judge Alvarez said, you have to weigh the mitigating factors and the aggravating factors on a case by case basis. There's no one size fits all. Um, and this is actually why we cannot just directly import the Scandinavian model. Wouldn't that just be so easy if we could do that? Um, but we can't, and part of the reason that we can't is because we have to contend with a uniquely American myth of perfection. In Scandinavia, here's an example that I think perfectly illustrates the difference, uh, the different approaches to the idea of perfection within a correctional context. Um, there's a prison in Norway uh, called Halden, and uh, most Americans refer, who work in corrections refer to it as radically humane. Um, they had an escape there. So these guys put a ladder up against the wall of the prison, hopped over with their AK-47s, got their guy, went right back over the wall, and they were in the wind, gone. Now, in America, the response to that would be lock the yard down. If they ever de did catch the guy, he would get eons of uh, uh, years added to his sentence and probably add another wall. In Norway, the response was nothing. They don't pretend that they can create a perfect correctional system. You can't because corrections involves people and people are never going to be perfect. Our system is far from perfect, um, but the imperfections of our system are sort of swept under the rug. In Norway, they just don't go there. They don't pretend that they're never going to have an escape, that they're never going to have fights on the yard, that they're never going to have issues arise. But what they've decided, the most important decision they've made is, we are going to prioritize humanity and normality over all else. Those are their touchstones. That's what they go back to every time an issue arises. Another example from Halden, um, they had a stabbing in their kitchen. Their kitchens are real kitchens. They have um, ceramic dishes and flatware and stoves and refrigerators and knives. And uh, one, of the, one, one prisoner stabbed another. So instead of taking away knives, they just bolted them to the wall because they realized that meal preparation is a skill they don't want their prisoners to lose. It's part of maintaining normality. Um, and so they found a solution that allowed them to maintain normality, to not deprive the entire population of their humanity for the mistake of one, because again, we're not prioritizing perfection, we're prioritizing humanity. This is a radical departure from the American correction system, um, but it's working. And I think that's why, as best we can, we need to pull those principles in to our criminal justice reform and why we need to pull those, uh, those same principles in as we help people re-enter and reintegrate into our communities. So at Atlas, what we've done is we have modified the Scandinavian system. The other, I should mention, the other difference that we have to contend with is in Scandinavia, uh, most of the prison population looks just like the population on the outside. They don't have a lot of ethnic and racial diversity. And studies have found that the, uh, the non-incarcerated population is far more sympathetic with those who are incarcerated when they look like them. And so that's something that uh, we don't have in America because our, our population, both in and out of prison, is quite diverse. Um, and so what we've done at Atlas is look at the system and try to figure out how can we modify it such that it will work within American society, American culture, um, and within American corrections. So we've come up with uh, sort of our guiding principle, which is consequences, accountability, rehabilitation, and restoration, um, which we call CAR. And we have woven this, this idea throughout all of our programs. Um, the first program that we launched is uh, a class 
for reentering prisoners. Um, we currently teach this to those who are incarcerated in the federal system. Um, and we have found it to be profoundly effective. Um, most of our graduates who get, who have actually gotten out, some of them are not yet out, um, have gone on to not just um, successfully reintegrate, but thrive and actually pursue the dreams that we helped them to identify during our class, which has just been an incredible experience. So we call our class the ID class, and this is a play on many ideas. Um, but it stands for Institutional Detox, uh, Instinctual Defiance, Identifying Direction, and Impactful Dreaming. And these are the concepts that we teach throughout our class. This class weaves together two uh, educational approaches. The first is we're focused on self-discovery or personal growth. Um, when most prisoners come out, foremost in their mind are, I've got to find somewhere to live and I need a job, right? And you have to have those, absolutely. What is less talked about is how are you going to not get evicted and keep your job and progress beyond just the first place that you land outside of prison? How do you keep going? And that's where self-discovery, mental fortitude, and resilience really come into play. Um, and that's what our class focuses on. So I thought I'd go over um, what each of these does. So with institutional detox, um, students develop an awareness of institutionalization. This is also a vocabulary word they don't generally have in their, in their toolbox. And so um, understanding what it is, they can begin to identify the uh, impacts institutionalization has had on them personally. Um, and that allows them to then come up with coping strategies that resonate with their own personality um, and begin to overcome those effects. So we help them develop a detox program for themselves. Instinctual defiance, a lot of, particularly when you're dealing with violent offenses, uh, these are in the heat of the moment situations, right? They're acting by instinct. What we work with them to do is to retrain themselves to develop new instincts. So the instincts they got that got them into trouble, we work with them on strategies for how to retrain themselves. And the tool that we use um, throughout our class is mapping. So we have students, while they're calm and uh, rational, we have them map out all of the problem scenarios that they see themselves potentially encountering upon release. So for example, we have a hard choices map. And an example of this is, if your best friend sold drugs with you and is still doing that, perhaps hasn't been caught, um, that's somebody that you're probably going to need to avoid in order to stay out of prison um, when you get out. But this is your best friend, and that's really hard. So before you're in that really emotional situation of getting a call from your friend saying, hey, let's go hang out, you need to figure out, OK, first of all, I don't want to do this. And second of all, what am I going to do when this happens? What am I going to say? And what am I going to do to sort of replace that situation? So I'm going to call my mom. I'm going to go biking. I'm going to go running. You've got to have that already planned out before you're in the thick of that emotional situation. Um, so that's what we deal with um, with instinctual defiance. Identifying direction, this is the mapping component of the class, and we really help them learn how to map out both. We start with daily to-do lists, and we progress to life goal. So um, by the end of the class, they have developed, one, uh, the ability to map their goals, to think through on a daily basis and an annual basis, and then long term, exactly what they want to do. And they've learned how to map out, here's where I am, and here's how I get there which sometimes involves mapping out questions they need answers to, and sometimes actually uh, means mapping out the, the precise steps they're going to take. Um, so when they finish the class, they have what we call a dream map, which is this is, where, this is what I want to be when I grow up. This is my ultimate goal. Um, and those maps have ranged from we had one student who wanted a simple life. We helped him map that out. You know, you don't have to, everybody does not have to want to go to school or um, own their own business or be a manager, you know, um, it's, 
it's very individual to each student. And so um, the other component of the class, the final one, is impactful dreaming. This is really vulnerable. And not surprisingly, those who are just coming out of prison are not super willing to be vulnerable um, straight out of the gate. But when you give them a safe space, you explain to them the benefits of being vulnerable, it's amazing what happens. Um, we rely very heavily on the work of Dr. Brene Brown, who changed my life, and uh, I share her widely because I think she's truly amazing. Um, and it, it, I do laugh because uh, when I was working at a large law firm, we, sh we showed her um, work on shame and vulnerability to female lawyers. They wanted nothing to do with her. They were like, no way am I going to be vulnerable. I don't even want to hear about this. We show it to our classes, and they love it. All of them are so touched. We have not had a single student who hasn't like been taken aback and realized being vulnerable does not mean you're being weak. It means that you're being authentic and you're showing a willingness to connect. That is a key component to success um, in our world and having a successful reentry. So once they've learned that it's okay to be vulnerable, then they begin to dream. And that's when we start to really have fun and we help them research their goals so that the map that they have when they leave is uh, one, visually stunning, because I think it's something we want them to put up on their wall to remind themselves. Um, plus they've been deprived of visual stimulation for however long they've been inside. Um, and so they tend to react very strongly to it. But we want them to remember, that's where I'm going. So even if today is really hard, even if I feel like I'm stuck in a rut, I remember that's where I'm headed and I can take it. I can get through this, you know, maybe stagnant area, this stagnant moment, because I know where I'm going. Our next uh, program is called Bond Out, and it's trauma support, because this is key. This is key. People are so incredibly traumatized coming out of prison. I had no idea until we started working with people and also in talking to Jonathan, who um, you know came out of prison with a plan and incredible mental fortitude and still has struggled, sometimes on a daily basis, to kind of believe that he can do it. And so Bond Out, um, we have artistic expression classes. Um, we are just about to launch monthly support group meetings. Um, we have fitness and adventure expeditions. If any of you saw the news, one of our expeditions got lost in the superstitions overnight. That would be, yes, yours truly. <laughs> um, but the bonds that they formed on that overnight expedition are tremendous. And that's exactly what Bond Out is about. Um, because now, when any of them are struggling, they know exactly who to call. Um, and then the other thing um, that will be part of the monthly support group meetings are psychoeducational classes with topical experts, because we have to give these folks the vocabulary to understand what they're going through. Without that, they, they feel so isolated and afraid and confused. And, um, and so we want, it, we want them to hear it straight from the experts' mouths and to be able to ask questions. Our next program, which we're super excited about, and uh, you guys are the first to hear about this publicly. So we've long known that we want to start a basically residential reentry program. And that became readily apparent when we started our um, ID class, which is a seven week class. And I mean, I feel like I'm feeding these poor students with a fire hose, because there's so much I want them to know about. And uh, you know, there's so much information they need to have. We cannot cover it in, in seven weeks. And so uh, we have designed and um, are hoping to be breaking ground on this by the summer, uh, a farm, Holobiont Farms. Holobiont is um, an ecological unit of diverse species living in symbiosis. So that's what we are working to create. Um, it will be, um, it's nonprofit, which takes out the predatory component of uh, basically halfway house or transitional housing. Um, 
it also takes out the institutional part. So you've got community corrections, which um, is not predatory in terms of corporate profits, but still kind of furthers the institution because it's run by the prison system, by the Department of Corrections. Um, and so we're trying to get people back into something that feels normal, like a home, like a community. Um, and, and so you kind of were able to get beyond the institutional part. And then because we're nonprofit, we don't have any corporate profits to contend with. We don't have shareholders to answer to. Um, all of the proceeds of the farm go back into operations and then into get started grants for our students which um, will be uh, basically funds that they'll be able to use when they leave the farm to get housing and transportation and uh, use towards education. Um, we'll be raising, uh, it will be an organic farm specializing in heirloom vegetables and eggs. Um, I'm a little bit of a nerd about agriculture, so I will spare you some of those details. But um, we're anticipating between 20 and 50 people um, will be able to be on the farm at any given time. It will be a year-long program because the idea of this program is to take some of the burden off families. As much as you may love your loved one coming out of prison, because they're so traumatized, it can be very difficult even for the most loving family to be able to contend with the confusion and the difficulties that come during that first year of reentry. And so we want, this program will keep people extremely connected with their families. We're well aware of all of the studies that say connection to your family increases your chance of success to 85%, right? So we need the families there. But they will live on the farm. So they will be able to receive intensive trauma counseling, vocational training, academic training if that's what they want, and also life skills. So how do you cook? How do you, fiscal literacy, how do you parent? Um, we have a whole host of, uh, of classes that will be offered in one month blocks. And that way, by the time they leave us, if they wanna be a farmer, we can help them do that. Um, if they've chosen another path, they've had the opportunity to get that education before they're forced to make it out in the real world, so to speak. Um, they also have developed an incredible network and support system. They will have developed a vocabulary to understand what types of trauma and emotions might come up with, come up for them as they progress um, back into their community. And we've also been able to educate um, the families. We'll be having community uh, dinners at the farm because one of our priorities at Atlas is to dismantle dangerous and um, incorrect stereotypes about prisoners. Um, and the best way that we found to make that happen is by having people meet them. Because when you meet them, you realize they're people and they're brilliant and they're amazing and they're friendly and they're not scary. Um, this farm will be fully sustainable and off the grid. Um, and as I said, uh, it will be nonprofit, which is a really um, important part of the, of the program. I'm gonna skip through because I know we're running a little behind, so. Um, the therapy and counseling programs that we'll be offering will be trauma therapy, substance abuse and addiction with an eye on long-term recovery, which means there is not one size that fits all. And that is also a cornerstone of Atlas. We very much believe in tailored rehabilitation. You cannot develop a system that is going to work for everybody. It, that is a recipe for failure. It just doesn't work that way. You've got to find something that the participants buy into and that resonates with their personality. Um, and then emotional intelligence therapy um, will include things like anger management, but it's much more comprehensive than that. So it's learning how to process complex emotions, um, including anger. But it's, again, kind of the relearning um, socially appropriate uh, ways and developing new instincts. And then discipline will be completely restorative. So there is not going to be any sort of um, punishment. There will not be, uh, you know, we have no room for revenge. So the discipline at, at Holobiont will be based on the idea of reflecting on your behavior which is a part of restorative justice, and then making it right. 
and whatever that looks like is, is how things are going to play out. Um, so that is hopefully coming this summer. Um, we're really excited about it. My dream is to be able to ride my horse to work with my dogs in my saddlebags. So, um, and then our final um, and most far-reaching project, and this is in the works, it's in research and development, we're not ready to roll it out, but is an entirely new correctional model. Both of us have vast experience with the current model of corrections, um, and it's not fixable. It's not. If it were, we would have found a way. But because primarily of the depth of institutionalization, we've got to start over. We have to start from the ground up. Now, does this mean abolish prisons? No. It means we eventually let the scales tip to a different model, where you introduce um, a new type of correctional model, a small pilot program, and once that succeeds, which I am 100% confident that it will, then you begin to implement that in other institutions, in other institutions. But the, the reason that it, you cannot just fix the model we have is because the guards themselves are too institutionalized. They have been taught year after year after year to see the prisoners as numbers. That is, uh, that's a recipe for disaster. In, um, in Halden Prison, I want to read you this quote from, I know, Wikipedia, but uh, my dad might cringe if he knew that. He's a professor. But um, they embrace a philosophy called dynamic security. And here is how the staff and the prisoners interact at Halden. The staff and the inmates develop are encouraged to develop interpersonal relationships, and they have found that this actually helps prevent potential aggression and guarantees safety. Guards eat meals and play sports with the prisoners and are typically unarmed because guns can produce intimidation and social distance. The interaction between prisoners and the staff is designed to create a sense of family. Uh, and because the staff can be role models to help inmates to recreate their sense of daily routine outside the prison walls, this has been particularly successful. Um, the guard stations are designed to be tiny and cramped to encourage officers to interact more with prisoners. Okay, that's the exact opposite of our system. But you can see that people are interacting on a human level. And that's what you need in order to have a successful correctional model. Um, and so those are the types of lessons um, that we're going to be taking from the Scandinavian prison systems and implementing in a modified way in, in our pilot program, which is called Sure Camp, which is secluded um, habitat for rehabilitation and restoration. So again, same principle will apply there. If any of you are interested, uh, in learning more about uh, the Scandinavian prison systems, there is a, Nor a Norwegian show called The Norden, N-O-R-D-E-N, that invited the former warden of Attica Prison over to tour the prisons in Scandinavia, and they produced a documentary about that. It's incredible. Um, and it really, watching the reaction of this former warden to the prison systems over there, and also seeing how successful they were um, is really eye-opening as to why we, we need to be pretty um, creative and innovative in our approach to criminal justice reform. So with that, I would like to open it up for questions. I know we're cutting a little bit into the lunch hour. We're going to be around most of the day, so we're happy to answer questions. Oh, gosh, no, I didn't even see you. Okay, sorry. I want to thank you for the vocabulary. Uh, some of you may know me. I am a former inmate. I did live at, Air, at Arizona Department of Corrections. And I didn't know the vocabulary that was happening to me. And it really was difficult. One of the things with the Department of Corrections is you can't call me Miss Allen or Sue Ellen. You have to call me inmate or 172187. But you can't call me by my name. It's not allowed. And that 
that's a tiny little thing. It's a tiny little, but it's a policy that they will not change. And I was at a meeting two days ago with two people, one from probation, one from parole, and they kept, and I'm a pretty confident woman, you guys can tell that. They kept saying, <laughs> offender, 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 offender. Everything they talked about was offender, and I kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller in my seat until I was really upset when I went home because I felt dirty. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why we use the term prison survivor, because at this point, prison is so traumatizing that when you come out of it, you are a survivor. You, your crime at that point is sort of almost peripheral, because it's certainly important, and I in no, mean, in no way mean to minimize the experience of victims, but what we do to folks in our prisons is really traumatizing and the only way they successfully reintegrate is to understand that well, and to the sure i know three people that are english majors that were in prison we can't think of a different word from offender ex-con ex-inmate ex-prisoner i just say ex but if anybody can think of a better word because this word du jour is offender and if you can think of one so the city of Washington, D.C. actually uses the term returning citizen. Yeah, but we can't vote. I'm not, I can't vote. I'm not a citizen. Yeah, so, that's yeah. about the closest I think they can. Yeah. yeah, and that's, it's so, yeah. we've also heard formerly incarcerated person, which one is a mouthful, and then the shorthand for it is FIP, which if you're an animal person, is a fatal feline disease. So, like, <laughs> that just does not work for me at all. Um, and that's why we use prison survivor, because it, but it, it's one of the hardest things yeah. in terms of talking about it. The, the word offender is, is I've, I've heard it referred to me time and time again. And w what people don't realize is, you know, my parole officer, <clears throat> who I had a great relationship with, um, but she would always refer to our population or myself as an offender. And so you're being labeled, and it's a negative connotation. It's, so it's part of that dehumanization process. They don't realize it because they're institutionalized as well but it causes harm to us in the way that we feel about ourselves, the way that we think. And, and when you are constantly being told for years on end that you're, in, in, in other words, you're not a human or you're less than, um, it affects your norm, the way you think about yourself without you actually realizing it. Mm -hmm. So even though you may get out and you may be very confident when you first get out of prison and you're like super motivated, you're like, I'm going to be successful, I'm not going back to prison, that's the worst place um, I've ever been or ever experienced in my life. Um, within just a few weeks of being out, this happens to pretty much any, everybody. They, they experience depression, uh, become very demoralized, because it's very difficult to succeed when you're starting out <clears throat> here from nothing and you keep hearing, no, 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 we got somebody more qualified for this position. Or you get uh, pigeonholed into predatory jobs that, that pay minimum wage or less, where you're doing backbreaking labor, there's no upward mobility, and then you just feel stuck. And you're like, what, what do I do? And that's when we talk, when she uh, quoted uh, what, uh, from the Shawshank Redemption um, institutionalization, when you're in prison, it's the worst thing in the world. But after a while, you get used to it. You have to adapt in order to survive. And the skills that you learn in there in order to adapt and survive don't translate to success out here. So you're being conditioned in learning, in learning to be a prisoner. And then you get thrown out into the world and you're told, go out, don't break any laws, be good, or you're coming back. So it's all on you. you know, if you come back, it's because you're a bad person, not because the, the, the deck was stacked against you. So you're coming out without the skills to survive. You're not mentally equipped to deal with rejection you're, because you haven't, you've, been, you've been constantly a failure, basically sitting in prison, you're basically been told that this entire time. And then now you're going out and you're trying to, to do something positive to put your life together and you're just constantly being told no. You get demoralized and you start to feel like I can't do it. You start looking at obstacles as something set in your path to prevent you from ever moving forward in life rather than something to challenge you, to help you to grow, to become a, a more refined person, to gain a skill. So those are the type of things that we talk about in our class and, and we really try to help people understand. And I experienced this myself, even having this vocabulary, even having this understanding that I've developed through you know, my own experiences, um, it's still very difficult for me. It's, there's a, it's a psychological condition. It's something that 
uh, it, it's, it's almost beyond control, but you have the power by understanding it and then uh, applying tools that, that you can use every day to, to slowly, like a muscle, uh, gain more confidence and, and uh, more ability to say, I can do this. There is a way around this. There is a way for me to succeed. It doesn't matter what uh, my obstacles are. And you have to have that. You have to be a strong person. You have to be a real survivor to make it because the, you know, it's very difficult. I just wanted to say that um, I think this emphasis on trauma and self-esteem is really important. Twice in the letter that I read this morning, in addition to claiming an identity as a writer, uh, Daniel referred to himself as a number in a convict. Mm -hmm. And um, but this past week, Prince William, because the uh, suicide rate for males under 40 is the top cause of death in the United Kingdom, uh, has made a plea for normalizing mental health problems. They're not yes. Being Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think in the back. Um, yeah. First of all, I want to say that uh, what the work that you're doing, I think, is, is fantastic and great. And I, what I'm going to say, I don't want to invalidate, especially the uh, personal statement, uh, testament of uh, of Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I have to say that uh, your focus on, uh, on, on what happens in the prison as, uh, as the miracle cure, so it's just uh, the inmates are going to, inmates, offenders, whatever you want to call it, uh, are going to have uh, a, you know, knives and, and, and forks uh, that everyone <laughs> else is going to be fine. Right. It's really myopic and, and kind of, I would say, naive to, to, to the point of really uh, Almost no redemption. The problem is that the comparison to uh, to uh, Scandinavia is uh, is kind of telling. The problem is not that the uh, the way that the prisons run there are different. The problem is that the societies are different. The poor that is true. are not as poor. The rich are not as rich. They all have free education from essentially the time that they are getting out of the the hospital all the way to you know to, to higher education. <laughs> uh, they have health care. And most importantly and relevant to, to what Jonathan said afterwards is when they come out, they start, they have a new leaf, the society allows them to turn a new leaf. They're not labeled with this stupid evil uh, mark of a, of a felon that prevents them from voting, from participating in their community in, in a full kind of way. That's yes. the problem. Not, not, I mean, yes. the changes in the, in, the, um, in the prison are going to come naturally afterwards. But abolish this stupid, evil felon mark on, on people that are coming out of prison. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that, <clears throat> that is absolutely true. And, and thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, you know, when you work in prison reform, it is the most overwhelming experience because everything is wrong. And you've got to, you sort of, in order to do anything and make any progress, you have to pick something and go for it because uh, there's just no other way. And um, what, what we decided was to focus on the back end um, of the problem, which is when, when folks are coming out. And certainly part of that is uh, working on, um, which I talked about a little bit, dismantling negative stereotypes. And, but in our eyes, the only way to do that is to start having society engage with these people. And part of that uh, comes in, um, in reworking our prisons. It is absolutely true that the Scandinavian uh, countries themselves, my sister lives in Finland, so I'm quite familiar with their social democracies and, um, and all of the benefits their citizens enjoy um, as a result of that political system. But one of the wardens, and this is in the Norden documentary, um, actually addressed exactly that point because that was that po your point is very similar to the point made by the former warden of Attica. And he said, you know, a lot he runs an open prison and he said a lot of people um, write me off because they say, oh, they just send you the easy ones. You've got an open prison. There's no way they're going to send you anybody who's really bad. And he said, quite to the contrary, they send me folks with extensive disciplinary records with severe disciplinary infractions. And he's like, but a funny thing happens when you start treating people like people. 
they start acting like it again. And, you know, our solution is not, it is a seriously long-term game here, right? We are well aware that um, we have a lot uh, to contend with, but one of the, I think, key components that we're going to um, bring into the discussion is we have got to let go of this idea of perfection, which is sort of interwoven in your comment, is the idea that we're going to um, be able to create a perfect prison system. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying um, to... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to address some of those things. W one of the things is um, we're not just taking people and putting them in a better environment. We're also have, going to have programming that's going to help them basically become aware and become awake and understand their role and the things that they have to do. So they're going to be growing as people, and they're going to be having the opportunity to grow as people, which I can tell you from firsthand experience, many of us just want that opportunity, and it's not, uh, it's not given to us. Um, and then secondly, yes, the entire environment or society um, has a lot of issues, but, w but the thing is, is we understand we can't necessarily go in and change those laws um, that say if you have a felony, you can't get housing, which is a law that, that, that's crippling for a lot of people um, coming out of prison. But what we can do is we can, we can create this prison that or a, a new system that um, that produces good results. And over time, people will understand, hey, this is producing not only good results, but it's not costing us as taxpayers billions of dollars. It's self-sustaining, and, and it can grow. So you can look at it as planting flowers in a, in a polluted environment, in trees. And over time, it will grow into this beautiful forest that will um, make the environment itself whole and healthy. So that's the way that we look at it. We, 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 we can't just go in and change everything and save the world, but we know what we can work with and we understand uh, where we can uh, apply solutions. And, and the way that we work is we say, you know, what is the real problem when we dig to the root of that issue? And then we, then we say, okay, let's work with this. How can we create a solution here? Mm -hmm. Rather than the system that we have that is um, it, it looks at the symptom and says, we're going to punish you for that. Now we're going to label you for the rest of your life because of it. You know, we want to do something different, and we can and we will. We believe in it. Yeah, the ripple effects from each individual we affect will aggregate over time. And that is, we're in this for the long haul. We do not expect to have immediate results because that, that would be completely, uh, I mean, it would be setting ourselves up for failure. But each student we impact, each person coming out of prison who we um, give new tools to and new understanding to, they're going to pass those on. And eventually, very slowly, we're going to have a dramatic impact um, over the long term. So I know that we're way into the lunch hour, so we're going to cut it off. But we're around. If you have questions, um, we would love to chat with you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <clears throat>